All right. Welcome back to another episode of Small Business Chronicles, where we explore the journeys and insights of extraordinary individuals that are shaping our business world. And look, you guys know the the routine. This is the Swiss Army knife of business shows. We talk about all different kinds of topics. And I'm super excited to uh, be in conversation with a, uh, a, a let's see, how, how do we put it pre-show? Um a time gambler, an educated gambler, an adventurer, a serial entrepreneur. Uh, you know, I'm I'm meeting with uh, Christian Espinoza, and he is he's a renowned cybersecurity expert. Uh, he's a he's an author of multiple books, and uh, most recently, he is the founder of a new cybersecurity company called Blue Goat Cyber. So um, I know we're going to have a lot to talk about. Um, so we'll just we'll just jump right in. Christian, how are you today? I'm doing well. I'm. A little bit exhausted. I've been pretty busy trying to really get my sales dialed in for my business uh, and trying out a few things using AI, but it's all good. It's part of the journey. Well, I, I know we we've had and we've discussed AI uh, on other other shows and stuff, so we won't we won't jump too far down the rabbit hole. But uh, I mean, you've um, you've got a lot going on, man. Like there's you've got you know multiple books, you have uh, multiple companies under your belt now. You, you're a real estate investor, which you know you and I have in common. And uh, I mean, how how do you how do you keep everything straight? <laughs> uh, I had I had a virtual assistant for a while that helped me manage all that because I think I have in total like eight different companies right now, uh, you know, structured a certain way with holdings comp- holding companies and a passive entity and an active entity. Um, but right now I, I don't have a VA, so I just have to block my time and say, you know, Thursday from nine to 12, I'm going to look at all my companies and make sure there's nothing going wrong or look at my specific um, property management companies. And, and that's, that's how I manage it. Otherwise, uh, you know, the time won't ever show up for me just to have time to take away from my existing company. I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to grow my cybersecurity company, uh, blue goat cyber. That's my priority right now, but I have to also, you know, maintain everything else like my short term rental properties and my, um, plug in to make sure I have dynamic pricing enabled. That's something that's broken. So I got to fix that too, you know? <laughs> Well, and, you know, I, I um, that reminds me of um, early on, I heard a quote from Gary Keller. He said, it's not about selling real estate. It's about following a schedule. Right. And I think that's true for any industry um, yeah. because you, your ability to block time and make sure that you are thoughtful in your strategy of how you utilize time, which is a constant, right? Everybody has the same amount, really mm-hmm. is the differentiator between whether or not you have success or not. And it's clear that you have a lot of success because you have mastered uh, blocking your time appropriately with so many different projects that you have going on. Yeah, I am a big fan of blocking time. I wrote about it in my first book. Uh, I have a chapter called Monotasking, which is the opposite of multitasking. So I be- I'm a believer that with concentrated focus uh, for like a 50 minute period or an hour period, you can get a lot more done than if you bounce back and forth between instant messages, checking your phone, checking your email, then trying to do a task. That's uh, a recipe f- for being busy, but not productive. The monotasking and the focus makes you productive. Well, there, yeah, there's a difference, right? I, I think we get, uh, I mean, there's a chemical reaction, right? That happens mm-hmm. when you're busy. Like It feels good to... Uh, have a checklist and check it off. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're working towards what your actual goals are. Right. And for me, that's uh, the thing I focus on the most. I realize there's only so much time. And if I'm not working on the right thing, then I'm wasting my time. And I have to make sure that the, that thing I'm working on, like my marketing for my company or my sales strategy is going to result in, uh, in leads and in revenue. Otherwise, you know, I wasted my time on the wrong thing. But I'm pretty confident that what I'm working on uh, will work because I worked on a lot of things that didn't work in my first business. And I've, I've tried to learn from the dumb tax, as they say, that I paid with my first business. Well, and I want, I want to talk about that. I'm glad you brought up the dumb tax because uh, <laughs> I think that anyone that has success has that in common is what I found. Um, so, I mean, can you share with us a little bit about your journey and, you know, what kind of challenges you faced becoming um, initially at that leader in the cybersecurity field and, um, you know, uh, maybe share with us what were those pivotal points along your path that really let you know that you were you were in the right direction? 
Well, I, like, like I mentioned, I paid a lot of the dumb tax. Uh, when I first start my, started my um, original, my first cybersecurity business, I kind of had the mindset that if I build it, clients will show up. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So I tried to sell cybersecurity to everybody, which resulted in me selling it to nobody. So I niched it down and focused specifically on medical device cybersecurity, uh, which is more of a blue ocean strategy than you know just trying to sell to everybody. Because if you try to sell to everybody, you end up diluting your message and you end up resonating with nobody. But once I narrowed it down, that's really when my business started taking off. And it's like kind of counterintuitive with your, at least for me, with my first business, because I'm like, well, what if I, you know, turn, maybe I have to turn down business if I'm not going to talk to everybody else, but it actually works if you niche it down. And as far as like a, some defining moments, I wrote about, this is like the catalyst for my book. I, I realized that all the problems I had, like 99.9% of the problems I had in my company, after I sort of dialed in the niche, uh, were related to my staff's lack of people skills or lack of emotional intelligence. In cybersecurity, there's a lot of highly rationally intelligent, high IQ individuals that um, for some reason have chosen, I believe it's a choice uh, in the majority of people, not to develop people skills and it's sort of just tolerated in my industry. So I've worked super hard to fix the culture in my company, fix my hiring process. I had to let some people go and I added emotional intelligence to my already highly um, IQ based staff or highly rational intelligent staff. And I think that really put me a leg up with my company and helped me uh, sell it as well. How do you define for you emotional intelligence? For me, emotional intelligence is being in touch with how other people feel and how you make them feel. And uh, some of the nuances that you may not pick up, uh, uh, just a normal like speech. It's really so, about I mean, how people feel. Mm -hmm. That that's got to be hard to build a hiring process around. I mean, I, I agree that it's important, right? And and I, <clears throat> I prior to real estate, I had an HR background, so I know that that is a moving target in terms of you know trying to build a culture, um, keep it active, and identify the right characteristics that are not necessarily things that would show up on a resume, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, and obviously, you mentioned you had a lot of a few people go. It's easier to see those things, and they're more apparent once they're with you. But what are some of the strategies that you found were effective in identifying that prior to bringing somebody on board? So I used to hire people purely based on their technical skills and that they technically were qualified for the job. And then I flipped the script and looked at seven core values that I adapted in my company, uh, like a growth mindset basically is one of them, like effective communication, um, listen carefully and respond clearly, for instance. And then I developed a set of interview questions around those seven core values, which those relate to emotional intelligence. And then asked the, the candidates uh, about a scenario in which they had to show uh, maybe improve their communication because the person they were speaking with wasn't quite getting what they were understanding. And when, when I asked the questions and my COO helped with these questions as well, based on the candidate's response, you could tell a lot about uh, if they had that emotional intelligence, if they had a growth mindset, if they were just going to blame other people because other people didn't understand what they were communicating. Uh, Cause I'm a big proponent that, people should understand what you're communicating, that the, the meaning of communication is the response you get. So the ownership is on you to change how you communicate. Um, and then only if they passed those criteria did I look at their technical skills. And I, I also did some personality assessments, such as a predictive index. And it was a pretty telltale sign to me if somebody refused to take the assessment. I'm not making mm -hmm. my hiring decisions purely based on an assessment. But I think the process of going through an assessment typically helps you with some awareness because it shows you how you view the world and how other people view you typically. And it might show like what you're going to be good at, what you might not be good at. Uh, so that was like one other thing I did as well. Well, I, I find personally in my, my own experience that that assessment <clears throat> is more about setting them up for success once they're already identified as a good fit. 
than it is um, for screening and determining if somebody is a good fit, right? Because it it allows you to know, you know, how they take feedback, how they value, um, you know, um, communication, what their style is. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I understand from the employee perspective or the perspective candidate, um, you know, perspective, because they they feel that it is a filter uh, and sometimes it's mis- misused as one. Right. Right. Um, in their defense. But but when done well, it, it really sets people up for success. So I love I love that you built your questions, by the way, around your culture first mm-hmm. and that that's how you made your process. And I think we overcomplicate it in business. You know what you want. In your business, you, you you know, I mean, just sit with yourself, spend some time with yourself, identify what it is uh, in writing, and then build your systems around it. Right. It, it takes some reflection and kind of zooming out a little bit uh, to do that. And then also, once you, once I hired people, you have to enforce the culture as well. So we hmm. did evaluations based on core value alignment not just based on you know how uh, great you were technically or um, what the net promoter score was from all your clients. You know we also looked at the core value fit, um, which which maintained the culture as well. Yeah. Well, so um, you know you've successfully merged this technical expertise with the leadership and emotional intelligence. Um, you know how important has that blend of skills been to your success within the cybersecurity space? I think it's uh, ex- extremely important. Uh, one of the things that I, I believe holds a lot of people back, uh, that it's a, the, the glass ceiling, you know, as they call it glass ceiling because you can't see it, is that lack of people skills or lack of emotional intelligence. And, you know, for me, I was... On my journey, you know, I, I used to be the person that wanted to always be smarter than everybody else, at least intellectually smarter, uh, or find a, a reason to say I was smarter, because that's where I felt significant. And I think in cybersecurity and other industries, um, that's the, the challenge, is we want to be significant. And if we want to be smarter than everybody, if that's how we, be, we find significance, then that comes across in our day-to-day interactions, and it's off-putting to a lot of people. Uh, and it keeps you in the glass ceiling. So I had to work on that myself uh, in order to transform to be a better leader and a better salesperson. Because as, as a business owner, I, I think the leader of the business should be the best salesperson in the business. That's my belief. So you have to have some people skills and emotional intelligence to do that. Uh, and I believe based on my journey, I chose a path where I had to develop those skills or I would not be successful. Well, and you share some of that journey in in your book, uh, the smartest person in the room, right? I mean, that's basically talking about that gap and in, in mm-hmm. your own um, issues with uh, discovering it. And you know, I think that um, while you're writing from the perspective of a really unique industry, cybersecurity, where um, you know it kind of attracts a certain uh, level of a, of, of intelligence. Um, it, it applies and it applies everywhere. You know, I mean, it, it really does. It's phenomenal read. I, I mean, what, what do you think the key message um, of that book is um, that you want readers to actually take away? The key message really is that if your life is not where you want it to be, uh, and I would say most people uh, would say that they have a lot of things that they're not doing in their life or not not accomplishing then the ownership is on you to, to shift your identity uh, and dissolve your ego as well. I, you know, I have a picture of a face dissolving because I, I think our ego gets in the way of protecting our existing identity. And if our existing identity is not getting us where we want to go, we need to find a way to shift our identity. Uh, and and I, I think that's the biggest message. Love that. Love that. Well, if you're listening to this and you have not picked up that book yet, make sure you check it out. But, I, you know, I do want to shift and get to talk about cybersecurity as an industry, too, because I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of listeners that we have that are in industries that are similar in that they are rapidly evolving all the time. Mm-hmm. So based on um, your expertise, um, you know, 
what emerging trends are you seeing that will significantly <clears throat> impact the industry in the near future? How do you watch for those trends? And, you know, um, what what process could others that are listening follow to look for similar, um, you know, trends in their own industry? Yeah, so there's a lot of trends in cybersecurity. Um, let me just take one step back, though. I, I think one of the biggest challenges in cybersecurity is people get too focused on the trends and they skip doing the fundamentals. Like if you do like five fundamental things, you'll greatly reduce your chance of a data breach. Things as simple as patching your systems and your applications and do a multi-factor authentication. Often people get hung up on doing like a hundred point checklist, all of it, like kind of not not to the degree they need to versus the top five things. So I, I think hmm. the fundamentals need to be addressed first. As far as trends go, I think AI is the biggest trend in cybersecurity. Uh, and it's ultimately going to become sort of AI versus AI. The cyber criminals are using AI to circumvent our defenses. And we're trying to use AI to uh, defend against the cyber criminals. So it's really, I think it's going to be up to who can master AI the best. Because AI is only so smart. You have to give it the prompts. You have to kind of program it. Uh, you have to give it the knowledge base. Uh, so I think it's going to be more of an AI versus AI at some point. And the other trend is a lot of jobs because of AI and cybersecurity are going to be obsolete. And that's where those people skills, like we talked about earlier, come into play. Because if you are purely technical and your job is something that can be figured out with a workflow, then AI can take over your job and probably do it better than you can. So it's, it's, your, it's to your benefit to develop those people skills. And the other trend, well, it, it, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was going to say, you know, I, it's essentially it's an arms race, you know, in terms yes. of the AI world. I mean, what you're talking about, you know, I think the analogy that I think about there is, you know, oh, you know, please get bulletproof vests. And then all of a sudden criminals now have um, armor piercing rounds. <laughs> right. And they, so it just uh, it, you're 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 dead on as far as AI versus AI. And that's always going to be a moving target. Uh, you know, that's that's a huge part of I'm sure what you do is. Um, doing the basics, but then also trying to stay ahead yeah. um, so that you're providing value. Yeah. And the other thing that we're evolving to is uh, physical devices, uh, like medical devices are one thing, like a surgical robot. Uh, but like I live in Phoenix right now and we have autonomous driving cars. Uh, Way they're called Waymo as a brand. And I take those cars all the time. I think they're safer than Uber, but still... From a cybersecurity perspective, and there's been a couple of movies about this. You know, I, I occasionally think, well, what if somebody breaks in this car, causes it to speed up to 100 miles an hour, and runs into a, um, you know, a light pole and kills me? You know, that's 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 always a possibility. And as we're moving towards more autonomous things, more robotics, uh, they're more risk in a in a tangible, physical manner versus just like your credit card being stolen. Yeah, I mean, you're. I, yeah, you're right there. I, I I immediately went to all the movies where it's like, oh, you know, you're on lockdown and and now you're you're under control. So uh, that's uh, that's a whole other topic. So, um, <laughs> but you know, Pat, look, past past um, entrepreneur, past um, author, past cybersecurity expert, and uh, and business owner, you know, you're also correct me if I'm wrong, a certified high performance coach. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what um, what led you to go down that path, and how has that impacted um, you know your businesses across the board? Yeah, so I was in Mexico doing an Ironman triathlon with my cousin and his wife, uh, and she basically had a um, an addiction, and I had some opportunities to talk to her when she was sober down there, and I felt like. I didn't have the skill set to help. Um, so I decided to go to high performance coaching training. I figured I would learn, even if I don't use it to, to coach other people, make money, the skill set would help me in my interactions with someone like um, my cousin's uh, my cousin. And that was the impetus. And ultimately, when you go through high performance coaching, you know, you have to get coached. And I've had a coach for probably six years. That's also probably one of the impetus is too is I had a coach and I know how effective she was with me. So I thought, well, if I get this skill, then I can be more effective with other people from a 
a leadership perspective, a clarity perspective, a communication perspective, a vision, just any element of high performance coaching. And I think it's it's helped me uh, not just with my staff, but also with myself, because I'm a believer that leadership starts with self leadership. And if you don't have the tools to tune into your emotions and tune into what you really want, then it's hard to help other people do that, in my opinion. Well, and I, I, I think that you just put a bow on this whole conversation, right? Because anybody listening is probably thinking, man, Christian's all over the place. But in reality, you're not. If you look at it, there's a common thread among the success that you've had across multiple different um, types of ventures, right? And it's that you are personal growth minded. You do focus on your own personal performance, uh, not only mentally, but physically and emotionally, mm -hmm. right? It's all aspects of the self that you really focus on. And that carries through in your, your work as an author, your work as a, as a, as a founder and CEO, as a leader of people, uh, you know, your work as being an intellectual or thought leader within the cybersecurity space. And so, um, you know, if I'm listening, you know, um, to this show and listening to your experience, uh, that's the thing that I would be writing down, right? That's that, that's the thing that I'm taking from it is if you want to have massive opportunity across multiple different ventures, you've got to focus on yourself first. Yeah, it goes to that saying that you've got to become more to attract more. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of us just work harder at doing the same thing and expect different results. And that only works for so long. I've tried to brute force things, but you have to become better yourself to get different results and to have better connections. And you have to you have to grow. And I think that's the common theme for for me. And in the past, I, I've I've gone from saying yes a lot to things, uh, opportunities, and now I'm more to the point where I'm saying no to almost everything. Uh, even like coaching, I had a a guy that wants me to coach him and I decided not to coach him because I'm try I, I'm trying not to be distracted. I'm trying to focus on my cybersecurity business and growing that. And I realized, you know, in the past, I kind of had too many irons in the fire. I was making progress and everything, but not to the, the degree and as fast as I wanted it to. So I'm shifting that uh, and narrowing down my, my focus more now. So I love that. I love that Christian. You know, it's, um, yeah, split energy, right? Multi it kind of yeah. goes back to what you started started uh, talking about initially. It's multitasking versus monotasking, right? <laughs> right. right? You're uh, you're you're spreading your your resources thin, and sometimes at the cost of your own, you know, energy or your own, um, you know, mental and and physical well being at times, right? If you get spread too thin, yeah, so. and it's a, it's mentally taxing, but it's also uh, for me, it was becoming frustrating because I was like, I'm bouncing back and forth between, you know, all these businesses for where I can just like kind of let some of them ride for a while and focus super hard on one uh, for a couple months, then kind of get it where it's self-sustaining to a degree and then focus on another one versus trying to move them all forward at the same time. And that's that's my strategy now. I'm I'm hoping it works out. <laughs> <laughs> well, so far, so good, right? You're, you're, you're making some progress. So, yeah. um, well, like, I, I know we could talk business all day long. Um, uh, we, we got on a total rabbit hole uh, on real estate before we even pushed <laughs> record. And so, uh, but, but, but I also want to be respectful of your time and our listeners time. So if you had to give one piece of advice to people that are listening to this show, um, in terms of personal growth, one thing that they could actually implement that would actually push them forward, what would that be? It would be to do some reflection and figure out what you want with clarity. A lot of us know what we don't want in life, but we don't know what we do want. And once we know what we do want, it shows up more in our life and a path will illuminate for you versus focusing on the things we don't want. Love that. Love that. Yeah. Because... Yeah, I'm, I, you're exactly right. If you're focusing on the negative, you see it. You might avoid it, but that's all you see. Yes. Right. Um, that's well, well said. Good advice. And um, look, I I really enjoy your time today, Christian. I think we've had a great conversation. I know that it'll be valuable to people that are listening. Uh, if they want to connect with you, or you know, if they're if they're curious about finding out more about Blue Goat Cyber, um, what's the best way to get in contact with you? 
Yeah, they can go to bluegoatcyber.com or my my website, christianespinoza.com. And through there, there's various means to connect with me. I'm also on LinkedIn and all social media. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you again for your time. And guys that, that are listening, if you really enjoyed the conversation, uh, make sure that you connect with Christian. And um, if you like this conversation, chances are you'll probably like some of the other business-minded conversations. So do all the podcast stuff, check out other episodes, like us, review us, g- uh, give me feedback. You know, if you guys are really liking uh, certain conversations, conversations, make sure you let us know. Um, and you can also check out more great business shows on our full podcast network of shows, which is at smallbusinessdelivered.com. So until next time, make sure that you guys are keeping that entrepreneurial spirit alive. And no matter how small your business is, remember that you have a big story to tell. Let's tune in next time for another conversation. Thanks, guys.